my name is Dr. Matthew McCoy and this is a presentation on evidence-informed practice uh, and specifically it's a presentation on evidence-informed practice and the management of vertebral subluxation in a vitalistic salutogenic model. One of the things that has happened fairly recently within the chiropractic profession uh, at the hands of subluxation deniers and those that control the chiropractic cartel is they've taken this notion of evidence-based practice, evidence-informed practice, best practices. I mean, they're all different terms that really mean the same thing. But what they've done is they have systematically dismantled it. And they've done this through government agencies. They've done this in Australia and Canada to be very specific. Uh, but there are also pockets of this happening in the United Kingdom and in certain states in, in the United States. And so this is a very dangerous thing. And the reason that they've done this, the reason that they have set out to systematically dismantle this is because an evidence-informed model actually is in terms of practicing in a vertebral subluxation vitalistic salutogenic model is is very well entrenched. In other words, there is ample evidence uh, to support the management of vertebral subluxation in this model. And if we couple that with the other elements of evidence-informed practice such as the uh, patient's clinical circumstance, you know, the patient that's sitting in front of you, uh, and the patient's desires and their wants with your clinical expertise, then vertebral subluxation management in, in the salutogenic model is well entrenched and it's perfectly supported in terms of an evidence-informed model. So, we understand their motivation for dismantling this uh, and ultimately as you'll see as this unfolds and we get to the end of this presentation uh, what they've done is is obviously wrong and it's not consistent with the evidence or with good science but the fact remains that they have done it they've been successful in doing it and they've been successful in doing it because good people in our faction of the profession that manage vertebral subluxation in a vitalistic salutogenic model have allowed them to get away with it. So let's take a look at what they uh, at, at what they're up to. Unless you've been living in a cave uh, over the past uh, few months, uh, you certainly know that uh, Australia. Uh, is the first country that, that we know of. There may be others that uh, we just don't know about, but Australia uh, is the first uh, country that has banned spinal manipulation in infants. Uh, and what they're in the process of doing is uh, undergoing a governmental review of this practice, and then they're going to come up with uh, a decision. Uh, everything that uh, I'm hearing uh, through the grapevine is that their intention is to ban uh, spinal manipulation in anyone under 12 years of age, uh, but that remains to be seen. One note I do want to make about this in terms of the use of the term spinal manipulation, uh, there's been a lot of uh, commotion about this. Uh, where some people are saying, well, it's not that they've banned chiropractic, they've just banned high velocity, low amplitude spinal manipulation in infants, and who really cares about that? Uh, what's fascinating to me is that there are so many chiropractors, and chiropractors in positions of authority, uh, regulatory agencies and, and trade organizations, that uh, number one, don't understand that when it comes to the term spinal manipulation, uh, that, you know, over 90% of the spinal manipulation that's performed around the world is done by chiropractors, number one, uh, and that there is uh, no evidence uh, in the scientific literature that spinal manipulation, high velocity, low amplitude thrust adjusting procedures are harmful to, uh, to anyone for that matter. I mean, even if we look at the 
uh, literature on uh, risks of spinal manipulation and harms, uh, you know, it, it's so innocuous that it, it's almost ridiculous to, to have to talk about it and address it. Um, but then when we get into talking about infants and so forth, you know, if we, if we look even outside of the chiropractic profession into the manual therapy literature and the osteopathy literature, uh, and the manual therapists in Europe and so forth, Biederman and Gutman, uh, and some of these folks uh, that have been doing manipulation of children and even in their cervical spines uh, for decades. Uh, and the literature, you know, is rich in support of, of this, uh, these types of, of moves. Uh, never mind uh, gentle, you know, uh, uh, low force or non-force techniques. Uh, that are done on infants and children. Uh, so, you know, let's dispel any myths that, um, you know, there's a problem with this. The, the reason this happened was because uh, a chiropractor in Australia, and this has happened before in Australia, or a chiropractor posts a video uh, of him adjusting an infant, a young child, and uh, you know, people in authoritative positions see this and they're freaked out by it and of course, you know, they got to shut everything down because, you know, they don't like what they saw. Uh, so that's essentially, you know, what's happening here. The problem is, is really how our profession has responded to it, uh, as we'll see shortly. So what we're going to do here is sort of start with what's happening in Australia since that's the most acute situation, uh, you know, that we're facing and it's, you know, the most acute area where uh, these subluxation deniers uh, have, have dismantled this whole notion of evidence-based practice uh, in order to suit their own agenda. Uh, so here we have the Victorian Health Minister uh, and a statement that she made regarding the chiropractic care of infants. So this was after this video came out and, you know, she saw this video and she was just appalled by it. Uh, it's appalling that young children and infants are being exposed to potential harm. Newborn babies are extremely fragile and it's important to be aware that the damage done to an infant may not be obvious immediately and may not manifest until years later. The CBA, that's the Chiropractic Board of Australia, must condemn this practice as unprofessional and unacceptable, and AHPRA must act, act quickly to stop these rogue practitioners in their tracks. Now, the, the, now the funny thing about this, and, and of course there's, there's nothing at all funny about it, it's all very sad and sickening, uh, you know, that this misinformed and uninformed health minister are, is making these statements knowing absolutely nothing about the science and research that supports uh, chiropractic, never mind, you know, chiropractic in terms of the care of young children. Uh, and on top of that, then she calls for an inquiry to gather the evidence and then come up with a recommendation, yet she's already come up with, you know, her recommendation. She's already decided uh, that it's unprofessional, unacceptable, and that it should be condemned and that anybody doing this should be stopped from doing it. So, you know, it becomes very obvious that, you know, this so-called, uh, you know, research inquiry that uh, the government of Australia is undertaking, you know, is just really a bunch of nonsense uh, so that they can, you know, check off some boxes that they did what they were supposed to do uh, in terms of uh, reverse engineering this and backing into the conclusion that they've already made, you know, that this isn't safe and, and, uh, and something's got to be done to stop it. Uh, so it's clear it's a bunch of nonsense. Just to get an idea of how deep this goes, this is from the president of the Australian Medical Association, Julian Raitt. Uh, so the Australians also have an AMA uh, in their neck of the woods to contend with. Uh, he says, and again, this is as a result of this video and all the hoopla that, uh, that uh, came out of it. He says, the idea or at least the concept of actually doing spinal manipulation in an infant is something the AMA would seriously discourage parents from pursuing. Uh, to be really honest, I mean, I don't even know what it means when he says the concept of it. Um, you know, it just reveals, you know, the deep-seated ignorance that uh, these people have and the contempt that they have uh, for what we do as chiropractors. Um, 
and making matters worse is when it's coming from our side, when it's coming from actual chiropractors and, and the chiropractors that purportedly represent us you know, through trade organizations. Uh, this is a statement from uh, Anthony Coxon, uh, president of the Australian Chiropractic Association. This was uh, a transcript, the actual wording of a statement he made uh, on camera on television in Australia when he was being interviewed about all of this. Uh, he says, is the care likely to be effective? He was being questioned about whether or not, uh, you know, there's evidence to support the, the management of infants uh, by chiropractors. He says, is the care likely to be effective or a benefit to young babies? Look, while there is some positive, moderate level of evidence, it's not definitive at this stage. Certainly not at the level of evidence where we would feel confident advertising on it, a website. Uh, you know, it's just really should be eye-opening to us that, you know, the president of, of, uh, of a chiropractic trade organization for an entire country is this ignorant about the literature that supports the management of infants. Uh, you'll see this later when we get into the hierarchy of research. Uh, there are practice guidelines which are at the pinnacle of the research hierarchy. There are practice guidelines that, that fully endorse and fully support uh, the practice of chiropractic, spinal manipulation, specific chiropractic adjusting, and so forth uh, in the management of infants and children. So the level of ignorance uh, here is, you know, never mind the medical people, uh, but the fact that this is coming from, uh, from a chiropractor and someone who's in charge of a trade organization representing chiropractors, it just boggles the mind. Of course, this made the news all over Australia. People were outraged by it. Uh, there were, you know, some interviews with patients that supported chiropractic and in infants, and you know, told all kinds of glowing stories about how chiropractic saved their child, and so forth and so on, which obviously, you know, we would expect to see. But uh, the point is that this made a lot of uh, headlines in Australia and became quite a big deal. This is just a screenshot of. Uh, the video involved in this and, you know, the ridiculous headline, uh, you know, in order to sell newspapers and, and, and website clicks, Cairo reform push amid baby back cracking video outrage. New laws regulating chiropractors manipulating the spines of infants are being pursued by the Andrews government amid outrage over the latest controversial baby back cracking video. Uh, so barbaric, you know, you know, and what is so infuriating about all of this is, uh, you know, I went and looked at the literature on infant mortality and birth trauma and the use of forceps and other extraction methods during birth in Australia. Uh, and it's just so obvious that, you know, this health minister, Jenny Makakos and Julian Rank from the Australian Medical Association, even our representative, you know, chiropractic, the president of the Australian Chiropractic Association, you know, clearly not aware that, you know, the, the medical profession in Australia, as they are in, in, in every country, are yanking on the heads of these children, these infants, uh, yanking on them, pulling on them, twisting them, pulling them out with forceps, leaving these children bruised and, and injured from birth trauma. And these are things that are fully researched, that we have absolute data on. Uh, but then it's appalling to them that a child, you know, would be adjusted with an activator. Uh, or that a child would be, you know, uh, in, in the case of this video, one of the things they were so outraged about was that the chiropractor was, you know, uh, hanging the child upside down by the lower extremities in order to determine, you know, the, wh where the upper cervical subluxation was or if there was an upper cervical subluxation. You know, yanking on children's head and twisting them and tearing ligaments and blood vessels and, uh, and muscles and, and so forth, that's okay, but, you know, you know, hanging a child upside down gently or adjusting them with an activator at its lowest setting, you know, that's barbaric to these people. So this is what we're dealing with. It's just the reality that we have to face. So that's Australia. Oh, we're going to move on to how this is also taking place in Canada 
and it's become a, a big issue in Canada. This is one of the headlines and many, there were many stories that came out in Canada uh, regarding this, uh, the issue of chiropractic and, and what they refer to as the vitalists who are promoting unscientific treatments. Uh, this one uh, was by a couple of um, uh, a couple of authors, Paul Benedetti and Wayne McPhail. They're, you know, well-known uh, authors that are tied into uh, the Friends of Science and Medicine. So they wrote this piece, uh, Chiropractors at a Crossroads, and they called it an investigation, the fight for evidence-based treatment and a profession's reputation. So as we go through this, you'll see, I want you to notice how they're using the term evidence-based treatment. Um, and they sort of hijacked this term and made the assumption that, you know, what we're doing as chiropractors in a vitalistic salutogenic model uh, is not evidence-based. Uh, and of course, nothing could be further from the truth, but, you know, because they wrote it, comes truth. <clears throat> Parents should be made aware that there is a lack of substantiated evidence for the theory of subluxated vertebrae as the causality for illness in children. And x-rays taken for this purpose expose the child to unnecessary radiation. This is uh, from the Canadian Pediatric Society, uh, and they have a position paper uh, entitled Chiropractic Care for Children, Controversies and Issues. Uh, so there's, you know, according to these geniuses, there's a lack of substantiated evidence for this theory of subluxated vertebra as a causality for illness in children. Well, clearly they haven't read the literature, you know, uh, not even in chiropractic. I mean, even if we forget about the chiropractic literature, and just look at the medical literature on subluxation in children, uh, the evidence is, is overwhelming. So, uh, you know, the ignorance is, 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 you know, it's just overwhelming when it comes to these people who are holding themselves out to be experts and that are running around uh, like Chicken Little saying the sky is falling because the chiropractors are adjusting babies. This was in the story by Benedetti and McPhail. There is no evidence subluxations exist. There is no evidence innate energy flows through the body, and no evidence-based healthcare profession believes any of this. Again, they're just pointing out the use of uh, evidence-based healthcare uh, in their argument. <clears throat> so what's happened is the the various uh, provinces in Canada, you know, have their own regulatory boards. These regulatory boards, these chiropractic regulatory boards, much like all the regulatory boards in the United States, Australia, UK, uh, and in Europe, these regulatory boards are run by, uh, mo for the most part, by subluxation deniers or, you know, those folks that are tied to them through the chiropractic cartel. Uh, the, the harsh truth of this is, is that subluxation uh, chiropractors, chiropractors focus on the management of rotable subluxation, uh, just generally don't like to get involved in politics. They, they think it's ugly, they think it's dirty, they think, you know, it, it, it doesn't serve them. Uh, so they don't end up on these regulatory boards. Uh, on the other hand, the more medically allopathically oriented faction of the profession, the subluxation deniers especially, they love to serve on these regulatory boards because they understand the control that it gives them and they understand the control that it gives them in terms of undoing and further marginalizing the practice of, of the management of vertebral subluxation. So this is a good example. The British Columbia College of Chiropractors came up with what they call an efficacy claims policy. Now, as you'll see very shortly, this efficacy claims policy wasn't anything unique that they, you know, sat around and came up with. They actually just adopted what Australia had adopted. Uh, and put their own sort of brand on it. According to the board of the British, College, British Columbia College of Chiropractors, chiropractic doesn't have any beneficial effect on childhood diseases, disorders, or conditions. Uh, and I want you to note the, the use of the words, any beneficial effect. Uh, and of course, we all know that anytime you use any kind of absolutes like that, all you need is just one example to prove it wrong. And of course, there is many, many, many thousands of examples in the scientific literature of the beneficial effect that chiropractic has on children suffering from a variety of childhood diseases, disorders, and conditions. 
This is a recent statement just uh, at the World Federation of Chiropractic meeting in Berlin just in March um, by this uh, DC PhD. He was talking about the management of vertebral subluxation and specifically the use of x-rays uh, to identify the misalignment component of vertebral subluxation. He said it's rubbish. It's absolutely rubbish. It's contrary to evidence and I find it very difficult to be proud of and it's something we just need to speak up against. This is a statement by a well-known subluxation denier uh, and uh, a few of her colleagues uh, published in a chiropractic, supposedly chiropractic, uh, peer-reviewed research journal, Chiropractic and Manual Therapies, just uh, this year. And she's very concerned. She says it's concerning that students who adhere to the subluxation model are prepared to operationalize their conservative, conservative opinions in their future scope of practice apparently willing to treat asymptomatic people with chiropractic adjustments. The determinants of this phenomenon need to be understood. You know, when you, when you read this statement, I, I think this quote is, is perfect for this discussion because it shows you how wide the gulf is between what the subluxation deniers say and believe and what those practicing in a salutogenic vitalistic model believe. Um, of, and of which there is ample evidence to support uh, in terms of the vitalistic salutogenic mo uh, management of vertebral subluxation. Uh, but this researcher, LaBeouf Eide, is, is just so concerned that anybody would be taught uh, to treat asymptomatic people with chiropractic adjustments, uh, you know, to care for these people, to care for these subluxations. It's just beyond her imagination. Uh, and she feels like the determinants that of this phenomenon need to be understood, that we need to understand why and how this is, this is happening. Uh, and, and you need to know that the, these are the people who sit on, uh, on the panels that, uh, the site team uh, panels that go to these schools that apply for accreditation and reaccreditation, and they make decisions about whether or not these schools are, are going to be able to be accredited by uh, the Council on Chiropractic Education. So this is serious business. <clears throat> Here we go. There is no literature. I can say unequivocally, unequivocally, he says, that there is no literature establishing the presence, or absence for that matter, of vertebral subluxation in infants. Now this is a chiropractor who says this. Uh, you know, again, it's one thing when it's outside chiropractic, but when it's a chiropractor that says something so ignorant uh, it's, it's just that much more disconcerting. Another chiropractor from a chiropractic college, a professor at a chiropractic college, the subluxation construct lacks sufficient evidence to even reach the level of a theoretical construct. It can't even be a theoretical construct. That's how little evidence there is to support subluxation uh, in this person's mind. And it should be considered no more than pseudoscientific dogma. This person is responsible for teaching the future generations of this profession. <clears throat> Here's a whole list of schools that have signed on to this organization, the International Chiropractic Education Collaboration. Most of these schools are in Europe, uh, but we also have uh, the University of Bridgeport and Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College that have recently signed on to them. Uh, and, you know, if you're asking what do these people, what are they against, what are, why have they signed on to this, this is an anti-subluxation hate group, basically. Uh, and they say, you know, no to vitalism, get rid of that, uh, no to open adjusting, right, they don't want any of that, get rid of that. Uh, they fully support the World Health Organization's stance on vaccines, right? So let's go vaccines. Um, and they've come out with this in terms of a position statement and basically said any of this kind of stuff uh, should not be taught. Uh, chiropractic and a vitalistic, salutogenic model uh, is antithetical to evidence-based practice, according to these people. They've signed their names to this. And by the way, 
Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College and a University of Bridgeport College of Chiropractic are both members, dues-paying members of the uh, uh, ACC, the Association of Chiropractic Colleges. The Association of Chiropractic Colleges is made up of the leaders of all of the uh, chiropractic colleges that are members of it, uh, and they apparently don't have much of a problem with this because they've not come out and said anything uh, relative to their member organizations, two of their member organizations signing on to this anti-subluxation uh, hate group. And just before we get deeper and deeper into this and you get more and more depressed, just let, let me let you know that there are some people working on this to try to undo some of the damage that's been done. And you should understand that they're basing this, this lack of evidence uh, that they contend exists, they're basing it on their own literature. In other words, these subluxation deniers for the past 30 to 40 years have peppered the scientific literature uh, with these lies and these deceptions about the management of vertebral subluxation, about, uh, the vi about vitalistic models, about salutogenic models relative to subluxation. And then they quote themselves and their other subluxation denying friends in these research papers. And then they publish another paper and quote themselves again. And we've had this sort of ongoing peppering of the scientific literature uh, for 30 or 40 years. So now they point to their own literature that they've created, which is all deceptive, by the way, uh, in order to buttress their arguments against uh, what you're doing as a, as a chiropractor managing vertebral subluxation. So what's happening is uh, the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation uh, has awarded a scholarship to Simon Senzon, uh, most of you probably know who Simon Senzon is, who is getting his PhD from Southern Cross University in Australia. And his job is to look at these errors in the literature regarding vertebral subluxation and to right these wrongs, to basically point out where uh, these quote unquote researchers have lied or deceived us or quoted the literature incorrectly or interpreted the literature incorrectly. Uh, and in effect to undo some of this. He's already written uh, 10 uh, peer-reviewed papers on this uh, and he'll be coming out with a dissertation on this as he completes his PhD. So, uh, you know, there, there are at least a few people that are aware of what's going on uh, and making some attempt to do something about it. <clears throat> and this is what happens on the ground, so to speak. You know, this is how regulatory boards use this information against chiropractors. This is uh, from a board of chiropractic examiners sent to a chiropractor who had run an ad that said uh, subluxation causes decreased human potential and function. Well, the board took some issue with that and called them before the board and said to provide documentation that the subluxation causes decreased human potential and function. You know, one would think that you couldn't get out of chiropractic college without being exposed to the science and the research and the evidence that supports, you know, the statement that subluxation causes decreased human potential and decreased function. Uh, that seems like a basic, right? Uh, but not to these people. And again, these are the people that run the regulatory boards. And, and this brings up an issue of, of where chiropractors need to be careful. Uh, if you're dealing with third-party pay situations where you are submitting claims and rendering diagnoses and so forth, be aware that if you are diagnosing you know, beyond the vertebral subluxation uh, and, and then you're treating those things, well, then you open up uh, you know, the door uh, to them. Uh, and they can come after you and, and get you to provide, force you to provide evidence that, you know, chiropractic is, a, is effective in this disease or that disease. Uh, the best advice I was ever given uh, on this issue was from Ian Grossom many, many years ago, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and he, he told us, he told me, told, you know, I heard him say this many times, for chiropractors to stick to the subluxation 
uh, and nobody can touch you. And once you go beyond the vertebral subluxation, once you get into treating all these other diseases, disorders, and syndromes, that's when you get on shaky ground um, in regards to these issues. Uh, the fact is that there is ample evidence to show that the management of vertebral subluxation can happen in an evidence-based model, and that's really what you should stick to. Here's an example uh, from the uh, malpractice world. Uh, this was a child who was diagnosed with autism. Uh, the child got into chiropractic care. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two, two cases, uh, this first one and then another one right after, where the mother in both cases, two different children, two different families, but the mother in both cases literally wrote a letter to the chiropractor and use the words, thank you for giving me my child back, in both letters. Um, because the, the children in both cases had such profound improvements uh, undergoing chiropractic care in, the, in terms of their issues. The problem is, in this case, um, this child ended up in an emergency room at some point. You know, she, she had been doing good under chiropractic care. Uh, health outcomes related to autism complaints were improving, uh, continuing to go to the chiropractor, but ended up in the emergency room because of a high fever. And during that emergency room visit was asked by the nurse, uh, you know, in terms of history taking, other doctors that they have seen and so forth. And uh, the mother said, yeah, I'm taking him to a chiropractor because he has subluxation. So this was a well-educated mother who was able to verbalize, at the very least, that the child was seeing a chiropractor because they were subluxated. Uh, so with that, the emergency room, uh, you know, the emergency room attendant, uh, after the child had, um, you know, had recovered from the fever and was stabilized and all of that as part of the discharge planning, had recommended, or I didn't recommend, referred the mother to an orthopedist because of these subluxations. The orthopedist uh, took some x-rays and uh, basically said, there's nothing wrong with this child, and the mother ends up filing suit uh, against the chiropractor, uh, you know, for taking her money for something that didn't even exist in her child. So even in a situation where the mother is fully on board and is fully supported, and thank you for giving my, my child back, uh, when, when elements of authority step in and have something to th say about it, you know, the two can change. Here's another example. This was a, a sad case. This was a child with ADHD who, again, was doing well into chiropractic care, uh, was coming in for routine visits. Uh, and on one of these routine visits, as the high-low table was going down, the child got the tip of his finger caught, and the table amputated the tip of his finger, had to have surgery and so forth. I mean, it's a tragedy. There's no question about it. Uh, it should be open and shut in terms of liability, uh, where the business practice, the, the business owner's policy would kick in. This is really a malpractice issue. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, the attorney uh, decided to send it to a chiropractor. In this case, it happened to be a subluxation denier. And this subluxation denier wrote a report back to the attorney that basically said, hold it, hold on here. This is not just a simple, you know, business practices liability case. Uh, this is a malpractice issue. This is a board issue because this child never should have been under chiropractic care because chiropractors don't treat ADHD, and that was inappropriate. Uh, so. You know, and, and then, of course, the mother ends up, the parents end up going after the chiropractor because of this. So this is the stuff that we see uh, as a result of these subluxation deniers uh, and what they have to say about the management of it. So this brings us to uh, the model for evidence-informed clinical decision-making. So this is a, it's important to, re to remember, uh, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I would imagine that if you're watching this presentation, you've heard of this model, you've seen this model, you've seen it explained in one way, shape, or form, uh, but let's go through it anyway. So when we look at this model, you know, we're talking about evidence-informed practice, so typically what most people focus on is the research piece. Uh, and, and this is a problem 
This is a major problem for the chiropractic profession. This is a problem in all of healthcare, but certainly in our profession, where you know the only focus is the research evidence. When in fact, there's a lot more to this model uh, than just the research evidence. So, in addition to the research evidence, we have the clinical state and circumstance of the patient that's sitting in front of the doctor. You know, does the clinical state and circumstance of this patient match what's in the research evidence? Can the research evidence tell us anything about this patient? Uh, you know, that's a question to be asked in terms of research. We have to apply that research to, to the patient that's sitting in front of you or see if we can apply that research to them. But that's not all there is to it. Then there is the patient preferences and actions. What does the patient want to do? That has to be incorporated into the clinical state and circumstance of the patient and the research evidence. Okay? Uh, if we use sort of an extreme example and use something outside of chiropractic, let's take a, a woman who has been diagnosed with breast cancer. And she's sitting with her oncologist, and the oncologist is going through a, an evidence-informed clinical decision-making process with his patient. And and he discusses the research evidence with her. And as it turns out, her clinical state and circumstance, the type of cancer she has, the stage that it's at, and all of that, matches what's in the evidence in terms of, let's say, chemotherapy and radiation to treat it. And then they have a discussion about what she wants to do. And the patient says, you know what? I don't want to go that route. I don't want to go the conventional medical route. I don't want chemotherapy. I don't want radiation. I want to try some other natural alternative means. Uh, and that should be perfectly acceptable. The patient, if the patient is truly autonomous and has the right and the ability to make these decisions, then the patient should be able to make that decision. And they're making that decision based upon what they want to do after considering the evidence, after considering the clinical state and circumstance, and in the center here, after discussing it with their healthcare provider who has clinical expertise. Uh, and, and can add to that discussion and add to the information that the patient needs in order to make uh, that decision. So this is the model for evidence-informed clinical decision-making. Okay? It is not just research evidence that we're talking about. It's research evidence coupled with the clinical state and circumstance of the patient sitting in front of you and the patient's preferences and actions. What does the patient want to do? Uh, and then you, with your clinical expertise, can help, pay, help guide the patient uh, into making a decision that's in their best interest. That is the model, regardless of what any subluxation denier or, or anybody else would like it to be. Uh, uh, here we see sort of a word salad of that model uh, from the evidence-based uh, medicine guru himself, Dr. Sackett. Uh, back in 1996 wrote this, evidence-based medicine, what it is and what it isn't. The conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence, current best evidence, what do we know right now? In making decisions about the care of individual patients, the practice of evidence-based medicine requires the integration of individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Uh, and of course, uh, what the patient patients' uh, values and preferences are. Patient preferences are critically important to clinical decision making and patient care. Few clinicians practicing modern day medicine would argue otherwise. In terms of, you know, we're going to talk about research hierarchies here. Uh, in terms of research hierarchies, here's, you know, just a few uh, pieces of information about the, you know, uh, about the RCT, the Randomized Controlled Clinical Trial that everybody puts on the pedestal. Uh, Hill, in uh, his famous book, Reflections on a Controlled Clinical Trial, published way back in 66, says, can we identify the individual patient for whom one or the other of the treatments is the right answer? Clearly, this is what we want to do. There are very few signs that the investigators are doing so. So the issue is, if we're, even if we're talking about the end-all, be-all of the research hierarchy, in some people's minds anyway, the RCT, does the patient sitting in front of us fit the people who are in that IR RCT? Do they mirror them? And can we then make a, de make a claim or a decision that uh, what happened to the people on the RCT is what's going to happen to this individual sitting in front of us? And this is obviously one of the grand flaws of the RCT. 
Anthony Rosner stated, to sum up, whoever is seeking documentation of clinical practice needs to be critical enough to avoid the lure of the gold standard in assessing evidence so as not to end up like the three prospectors in the treasure of Sierra Madre, who, much to their great horror, find that they have come up with fool's gold. David Eddy said only about 15% of medical interventions are supported by scientific evidence. This is partly because only 1% of the articles in medical journals are scientifically sound. Do we want evidence? Of course we want evidence. We want objective, reliable, uh, and valid evidence about, the about health care interventions. The problem is that over and over again we find that what's in the medical journals aren't necessarily scientifically sound. So we can't just rely on the research evidence uh, and the model for evidence-informed clinical decision-making says we shouldn't, that we should look at the clinical state and circumstance of the patient sitting in front of us, that we should consider the patient's needs and wants, and we sh should consider what's in the uh, research evidence as well. In conclusion, approximately half of the recommendations for primary care practice are based on patient-oriented evidence, but only 18% are based on patient-oriented evidence from consistent high-quality studies. Again, what is the validity, reliability, uh, and objectivity of the research we're relying on to make decisions? I won't spend a lot of time on this, just want to make the point that when we're talking about uh, evidence, uh, not only is there a hierarchy of research in terms of, you know, case studies, uh, case series, clinical control trials, um, uh, and so forth, but there's also ratings of, um, of the research. Uh, and there's different rating schemes, so uh, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's, it won't really uh, further our, our uh, discussion. Uh, in terms of this one anyway. Uh, but there's different, again, there's different schemes for this. Some give classes of evidence, uh, some give levels of evidence and so forth, and then they describe uh, which e each of those classes or levels of evidence are. <clears throat> in terms of talking about epistemology, you know, one question I always like to ask the subluxation denier when they say, you know, there's no evidence for this or there's no evidence for that, the immediate question to them would be, well, what evidence will you accept? Uh, you know, if, if somebody tells you that the only evidence they're going to accept is the randomized clinical trial, then the harsh reality is that most medical interventions would have to stop right now uh, because there are very little in terms of medical interventions that are at the RCT level, and especially as we get into dissecting you know, the subluxation denier's new model of evidence-based practice, uh, there's, there's really no evidence to support the, the practice of medicine uh, if, if medicine were to adopt their standards. Uh, and then, as I said, what is the strength of the evidence? And are we talking about science or are we talking about scientism, which is, you know, more of a religion uh, of science than anything else? So here is the uh, traditional sort of hierarchy of research design and levels of scientific evidence. Uh, you see it starts down at the bottom here with animal and laboratory studies. Uh, then we get up to the case report, case series, narrative reviews, expert opinions, editorials. Then we get into case control studies, cohort studies, and the RCT right there, sort of getting close to the pinnacle. But notice at the top here, then we have meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and at the very pinnacle, we have clinical practice guidelines. And this is very important to remember. This is going to become important as we get towards the end of the presentation, uh, because chiropractic, uh, and especially vertebral subluxation, actually has clinical practice guidelines that support uh, the vitalistic salutogenic management of vertebral subluxation, despite what the subluxation deniers say. So that's a traditional uh, research hierarchy. Now, what's happening out there is that the subluxation deniers are, and regulatory boards, you know, in lockstep with them are going after chiropractors based on this notion of misleading claims. So no matter where you practice, no matter what country you practice in, no matter what state in the United States or province and county you practice in, there's going to be something in the law, in the statute, 
or the rules and regulations that govern the practice of chiropractic in your state or province or country that addresses the making of misleading claims. Uh, you know, making promises to somebody about something or telling a patient that, you know, the adjustment will do this or that uh, and not having a, any evidence to back it up. So that's how this notion of this evidence-based model uh, as, as, you know, sort of out of touch as it might seem to somebody who's, you know, bent over adjusting tables all day just taking care of people, uh, this is where the rubber sort of meets the road for the individual practitioner. Uh, because if you're advertising or making claims or saying something to your patient that in the eyes of the regulatory board uh, there is no evidence for, uh, then you're in trouble. Uh, and in fact, our whole profession is in trouble. Uh, and if the regulatory boards have moved the goalpost, if they've decided that they're going to come up with another definition of evidence-based practice that suits their agenda to get rid of you, uh, then, you know, eyes wide open. You know, we really need to be paying attention to this because it affects your ability to be bent over those tables and taking care of people uh, and releasing the imprisoned impulse every day. So this is where it all started. It all started in the United Kingdom. It actually started a long time ago. I mean, let's face it, there, is, there has been a split in this profession since uh, 1895, since day one. Uh, the problem is that ha as time has gone on, uh, we're over 100 years into this, uh, the different factions have become more entrenched. Uh, and when we talk about the chiropractic cartel and the subluxation deniers, uh, they, they have seized control of the regulatory boards, they have seized control of the educational, regulatory, and licensing functions of the entire chiropractic profession. Uh, there can be no doubt about that. That is very clear from their own writings, uh, and it's very clear by the political uh, machinations of the profession and what's going on relative to the regulatory agencies that govern uh, you know, regulatory boards, uh, national boards, the chiropractic colleges, uh, and, and how they have metastasized in terms of international arms uh, uh, and have sort of centralized uh, this whole process. So where this started most recently is probably the better way to say this is with the, uh, what is referred to as the Bronford Report. Uh, it's referred, as the, referred to as the Bronford Report because the lead author is Bronford, but, you know, there were a number of other usual suspects that uh, were co-authors uh, with Dr. Bronford on this. And essentially what Bronford was charged to do was review the literature uh, to see what the uh, level of evidence was for, um, for chiropractic. And really it wasn't about chiropractic. It was about spinal manipulative therapy. So what's the, you know, literature base for spinal manipulative therapy? And of course, they're looking at RCTs because, you know, that's way up there at the top and systematic guidelines are at the top and, and so those are what they looked for. So I'll let you guess in terms of what they found um, that chiropractic is good for or what spinal manipulation is, is good for. And in, in essence, it's basically good for neck pain, back pain, headaches, and a few other things that they threw in for good measure. Uh, so this is nothing new, really, um, except that this ended up being the impetus for a no large number of complaints, hundreds of complaints filed against chiropractors in the UK. And the way they did this was they would just went to their websites. And they started uh, pulling all this stuff off the websites where chiropractors were making claims for anything outside of what the Bronford report said. And they started pulling them in and threatening them and sanctioning them and fining them and, and all that sort of stuff and made examples out of them. And guess what? The rest of the chiropractors in the United Kingdom, for the most part, saw this happening and kept their mouths shut. And so, you know, years have gone by since this happened, and there's been no overturning of any of this in the United Kingdom. In fact, what happened is it has just spread. Uh, it has spread now to Australia. This is going back a few years. This was sort of the first warning shot from the Chiropractic Board of Australia when they sent out <coughs> uh, 
uh, this notice to chiropractors about inappropriate claims of benefit. Remember, we were talking about misleading claims before. Uh, in the first part, they just talk about basically uh, an informed consent process. Patients should be informed when making health care choices. They talk about advertising, ensure that statements and claims uh, aren't false, misleading, or deceptive. Uh, and then they say the board's concerned about a number of practitioners who are making claims and advertising that there is a relationship between manual therapy for spinal problems and achieving general wellness or treating various organic diseases and infections or that spinal problems may have a direct role in various organic diseases and infections. And they state unequivocally there is insufficient scientific evidence to support these claims. Uh, you know, so if we take away the treating of disease and infections and, and so forth uh, and say here, you know, where, the, where they're against just manual therapy and achieving general wellness, right, I mean, they're even against that. Uh, and, you know, there, there is ample evidence in terms of uh, quality of life improvements and quality of life people undergoing chiropractic care uh, to, to, you know, show that that's a falsehood right, right, right there. Uh, but then they go on, they say, of particular concern is the number of treatment cl uh, claims and advertising relating to infants and children. Claims suggesting that manual therapy for spinal problems can assist with general wellness and or benefit a variety of pediatric syndromes and organic conditions are not supported by satisfactory evidence. You know, the key words here are satisfactory evidence, right? Uh, pay attention to that. This includes claims relating to developmental and behavioral disorders, ADHD, autistic spectrum disorders, asthma, infantile colic, bedwetting, ear infections, and digestive problems. Pay attention to that laundry list of, of disorders and syndromes that they're talking about, okay? And, you know, recall satisfactory evidence that they point out here. Advertising claims that are contrary to high-level evidence. Of course, we know what high-level evidence is, right, RCT. So if you don't have an RCT, <clears throat> um, you can't use it. You can't say it. You can't claim it, okay? And then they tell you how they devoted a whole newsletter to this, and they warned you to cut it out, right? Now, to be honest, this coming from the Chiropractic Board of Australia shouldn't be too surprising because this is the same board that doesn't want you to hug your patients, right? So they came out with this in 2011, and the answer to the question, is it okay to hug my patients, uh, I'll tell you, save you the reading of it, the short answer is no. Uh, non-therapeutic touching <laughs> or non-therapeutic physical contact with patients uh, is not a good thing in their mind. So there you have it, right from the board itself. Skip that one. So we're going to go back to Canada and back to that article about uh, chiropractors at a crossroads and the fight for evidence-based treatment and a profession's reputation. This is by Benedetti McPhail, right? Uh, so they focused in this article on this child with autism. When Christopher Lehman was nine years old, his mother took him to a chiropractor who claimed treatments could correct his autism. The family spent at least $5,000 before Christopher called a halt to the treatments. Honestly, I felt like I was, I hate to say it, duped, his mother said. Uh, so now none of us were in the room uh, when uh, this chiropractor was talking to this family. Um, so we don't know what he said. We don't know what she said. We don't know what happened. Uh, but it's important to understand that regulatory boards uh, have to, uh, and they typically do, uh, take the word of the complainant first. Uh, you know, if all they have is the word of the patient and the word of the doctor and there's nothing else to support either one, uh, they're going to tend to side on, on the side of the patient uh, because they have a duty to protect the public health. So uh, just something to think about, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, uh, since so far we're talking about neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, it's important to understand that uh, these families, these mothers, these fathers, these families, these children, they're, they're, they're a vulnerable population. And so you should be very clear in your explanations to them about what you can or cannot offer them uh, because all that matters in that interaction is the perception. It doesn't matter what you think you said. It matters what they heard you say and what they perceived you to say. 
And so what happens in these situations is there's this claim of substitution harm, that the, the chiropractor substituted an unproven technique, an unproven remedy, a, a.k.a. chiropractic, uh, for something that is known to help drugs, medication, occupational therapy, whatever else, you know, uh, they're doing for that particular uh, condition. Uh, and so this is a charge that's levied against chiropractors in many of these regulatory complaints uh, that they call substitution harm. In these bills that came out in Canada, it was interesting that, you know, they decided to, to focus on a few um, a few well-known chiropractors who serve on the regulatory boards up there. And they went to their websites or other places where they had quotes or statements about chiropractic and they pulled them off uh, and they used them as evidence of unscientific views. Um, you know, so this one, you know, this one's a little metaphysical, but I guarantee you that uh, I could build evidence bridges uh, between all of these statements. Uh, in terms of the science that supports what, um, what she's saying here. Uh, here's another one. Uh, again, it's, it's a little bit metaphysical, but we can build evidence bridges to support this. But this is my favorite. This is my favorite statement that they felt was unscientific, that physical, chemical, and emotional stress is the underlying cause of subluxations. You know, that to them is unscientific. You know, and of course, we know beyond chiropractic uh, that, uh, you know, the inability to adapt to physical, chemical, and emotional stress uh, is not just the underlying cause of subluxations, it's the underlying cause of all disease. Um, and, you know, that's really not a contentious issue by anybody that understands the literature. This one is from Alberta, the Alberta College of, and Association of Chiropractors. And, you know, don't let the name fool you. This is not a school. This is, uh, in Canada, a lot of times they call their regulatory boards colleges. Uh, so that's where that terminology comes from. So this is the regulatory board. This is their position statement on chiropractic and pediatrics. And I'm just showing you this as one example to show you how the subluxation deniers who've gotten control of these regulatory boards are stripping the neurological component out of uh, the subluxation and out of what uh, chiropractors manage. And they do that right here in this first paragraph. Chiropractic treatment is based upon basic biological and physiological sciences that apply to children from birth to full development as they do the adult. It is an effective treatment for musculoskeletal conditions of the neonate, infant, toddler, preschool age, pre-adolescent, adolescent child. So, you know, on the face of it, oh, yeah, we support chiropractic and children and, and kids taking care of, of even neonates, you know. But it must be a musculoskeletal condition. And, of course, vertebral subluxation, by definition, is not a musculoskeletal condition. It's a neuromusculoskeletal condition. Um, and so, you know, we get some idea of where they're going with this and how they are, you know, uh, as another example, how, about how they've just dissected out uh, pieces of the evidence-based puzzle. Uh, we already talked about the statement. So here is that efficacy claims policies from British Columbia, and we, and we need to spend a little bit of time on this because this is really the heart of how they are redefining uh, evidence-based practice. So this is from the College of Chiropractors in British Columbia. This is their efficacy claims policy. <clears throat> um, they have their policy statement right here, and then we're going to blow this so you can see it better. Okay. Um, due to the absence, due to the absence of acceptable evidence, and again, you saw, uh, you know, in the previous uh, slide how they, you know, they don't just talk about evidence, but they always put an adjective in front of it. Uh, so in this case, they're talking about acceptable evidence. Due to the absence of acceptable evidence, and keep that in the back of your mind, supporting such claims, registrants must not represent to the patients or the public that chiropractic can be used to treat diseases, disorder conditions such as Alzheimer's cancer, diabetes, infections, infertility, Tourette syndrome, or, um, you know, so in this first thing, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't have really any argument with this because chiropractic is not the treatment of any of those diseases. Chiropractic is the management of vertebral subluxation. 
Uh, and if a person with vertebral subluxations happens to improve uh, that also has one of these diseases, disorders, or syndromes and happens to improve, uh, then so be it. But the focus of, of the care is the management of vertebral subluxation. But where things really get problematic is here under B. Has any beneficial effect? So regist registrants must not represent the patients or the public that chiropractic has any beneficial effect on childhood diseases, disorders, or conditions such as ADHD or ADD, autism, Asperger's, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, or developmental and speech disorders. Any beneficial effect. That's just nonsense, right? The above list of diseases, and this, this is, I love this, the above list of diseases, disorders, or conditions is neither final nor conclusive. Absent acceptable evidence, acceptable, again, acceptable evidence, registrants are not free to make claims about the effectiveness of chiropractic in treating a disorder, disease, or condition simply because it's not included on the list. So good luck to you figuring out what they think should be on the list if they don't tell you, right? So now we got to drill down in terms of well, what the heck is acceptable evidence according to these people. Acceptable evidence means objective, clear evidence based on acceptable principles of good research that support the therapeutic claim. Well, who could argue with that, but what does that really mean? Well, we got to go further. See Appendix N. So now we go to Appendix N. And we've blown this up a little bit, but let me just show you on here while I have this. Where did they get this from? What is acceptable evidence adopted from the Australian Health, pra Health Practitioner Regulation Agency? So they took this from Australia and just adopted it for their own. Okay. <clears throat> So let's see what they say here. What is acceptable evidence? Chiropractors must not advertise health benefits of their services when there is not acceptable evidence that these benefits can be achieved. When assessing whether there is acceptable evidence for therapeutic claims, the issues to consider include, is the evidence relied on objective and based on acceptable principles of good research? Is the evidence from a reputable source, for example, a properly peer-reviewed, peer-reviewed journal? So what is properly? I mean, how do they define properly? Do the studies used provide clear evidence for the therapeutic claims made, or are they one of a number of possible explanations for treatment or outcomes? For treatment outcomes. Have the results of the study been replicated? Results consistent across multiple studies replicated on independent populations are more likely to be sound. Has the evidence been contradicted by more objective, higher quality studies? For example, evidence from a single study would not be acceptable evidence if it is contradicted by a systematic review. Statements and claims and marking that are contrary to higher level evidence are not acceptable. So, you know, in a nutshell, what they're telling you here for sure, beyond all the other stuff that they don't really answer, they just tell you that it must be objective and based on acceptable principles and so forth. Uh, and we could all as good and agreeable people say we agree on that, but the reality is they're the regulatory board, so they're the ones that are going to end up deciding. And if they are controlled by subluxation deniers, what are they un ultimately going to end up deciding? Uh, but the bottom line is right, right here, higher level evidence. So. You know, they're not interested in case studies or case series or cohort studies or even observational studies. You know, what they're interested in are RCTs. They go on on the next page here, studies involving no human subjects. So basics, all basic science research is out. If it's animal research or any other type of physiological research or things like that that do not involve human subjects, you can't consider it as evidence. Before and after studies with little or no control or reference group, such as case studies. So case studies are out. Now that's despite plenty of authoritative sources that state that a well-designed and well-discussed uh, uh, case study can be better than an RCT, can be better than an observational study. Never mind if we have you know, hundreds of case studies on a particular topic. Uh, Self-assessment studies. So this is where a patient uh, self-assesses their health outcomes, self-reported quality of life. This is one of the most well-entrenched uh, practices in research today. 
and according to these geniuses, it's not evidence. So self-reported quality of life can't be included in terms of evidence. Anecdotal evidence based on observations and practice. Now, they didn't come right out and say this, but here's what that means. If you go back to the evidence-based model and you look at the, the piece on clinical expertise, right? You remember that piece, clinical expertise? Well, they say that's out. It doesn't matter what your experience has been. It doesn't matter if you've treated thousands of patients over 20 or 30 or 40 years. That evidence cannot be used in terms of help, helping a patient make an evidence-informed healthcare decision. Uh, and then last one here, outcome studies or audits unless bias or other factors may, that may influence the results are carefully controlled. The evidence base for clinical practice is constantly developing, so it's important to Kairos make sure that any scientific information they rely on is current. You know, it's funny that they're holding the chiropractor and chiropractor to the current best practices, but the board itself is completely ignoring those best practices and coming up with this nonsense that they just made up out of, out of, out of thin air. I should say the Australians made up out of thin air. Uh, chiropractors must take care not to mislead or create false impressions when using scientific information. Scientific information and marking must be presented in a manner that is accurate, balanced, not misleading, and using wording that will be readily understood by the recipients. The source of the information must be accurately cited. Now, that was British Columbia. Not to be outdone, the Manitoba Chiropractors Association saw what Columbia did and basically said, hold my beer. Right? They just came out with this called communication on topics outside the chiropractic scope of practice. So, you know, it's been well known that in Canada, chiropractors can't even discuss the issue of vaccination uh, uh, in, in, in any of the provinces uh, because it's not in the scope of practice. Um, and there have been plenty of examples where chiropractors have been brought to, brought to bear on this. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 you know, that's, that's notwithstanding my own personal opinion that, you know, in terms of discussing vaccination with patients, uh, it's probably not a good idea to be doing that anyway. Uh, other than, you know, just referring uh, patients to the appropriate sources, uh, like the National Vaccine Information Center, the CDC, and then telling them, hey, take a look at both, and then, you know, make an informed decision. Uh, but certainly in Canada, you, you're, they don't want you talking about it at all. So now what they're, they're doing, though, uh, and to me this is really a free speech issue, uh, but the argument is made that because you're a licensed healthcare professional that, you know, you don't get to exercise your free speech. Uh, and there's also a recent example in Canada where they went after uh, a female chiropractor uh, and threatened her um, that if she didn't just go ahead and give up her license, she was posting about vaccinations on her personal Facebook page, personal social media. Uh, and that was one of the arguments she made that it wasn't she wasn't doing it as a chiropractor she's doing it as a you know free human being uh, and they basically said too bad so sad uh, you're going to give up your license and if you don't give up your license we're going to make you undergo a mental competency exam and then we're going to take your license away from you uh, so she ended up just surrendering her license rather than go through that so They've, they've been successful at taking away the chiropractor's uh, ability to exercise uh, free speech uh, on the issue of vaccination, and now they basically just want to expand that to, to not be able to talk about anything that they do not deem to be within uh, the chiropractic scope of practice. Um, so that's what this policy directive is about. Uh, to ensure compliance regarding communication on topics outside the scope of practice. Uh, if you communicate on a topic outside the chiropractic scope, you must advise the patient that the topic's outside the scope of practice and that they should consult with a healthcare professional who has the act within her scope of practice. You should not respond with advice, opinions, or recommendations on the topic. Uh, you should encourage the patient to be an active participant in their own health and to make fully informed decisions concerning your care. You know, that, that third one is kind of laughable. Encourage the patient to be an active participant in their own health and to make fully informed decisions concerning your care, but you, the chiropractor, are not allowed to help them. 
So again, this is you know part of that dissection and dismantling of the evidence-based model. Uh, they're taking the, the clinician out of that equation, in this case the chiropractor, and not allowing you uh, to help the patient make an evidence-informed healthcare decision. Failure to, to comply to the limitations. Uh, members must take great care in considering what communications they might have with patients. Failure to comply with this practice. Direct them may result in the following, and they tell you basically what they're going to do to you. Uh, providing opinions or recommendations on topics such as vaccination and immunization, use of pharmaceuticals or surgery, allergies, Alzheimer's. Notice this list again. We're seeing the same list again. Uh, the Australians and the Canada, Canadians really don't want you doing anything with, with patients with these problems. Allergies, Alzheimer's, dementia, Asperger's, asthma, attention deficit, uh, autism, cancer, cerebral palsy, cognitive impairment. Developmental speech disorders, diabetes, Down syndrome. It's on the next page. <clears throat> Fertility, fetal alcohol syndrome, flu or colds, immunity, infantile colic, infections, infertility, multiple sclerosis, nocturnal, I mean, it, it just goes on, right? Uh, or anything else that is considered outside of what is a reasonable clinical encounter for a chiropractor could be found by a court to be out of scope of a chiropractor. The above list uh, is neither final nor conclusive. We've seen that before. Absent of acceptable evidence, we see it again. Absent of acceptable evidence, registrants are not free to make claims about the effectiveness of chiropractic in treating a, dis a disorder, disease, or condition simply because it's not on the list. Uh, and they let you know they can find, they can find you. Uh, they do here t tell you what the Practice Act, uh, uh, how the Practice Act is defined in Manitoba. Any professional service usually performed by a chiropractor, including the examination and treatment principally by hand and without the use of drugs or surgery of the spinal column, pelvis, and extremities, and associated soft tissues and other such services as may be approved by the regulations. So that brings us really full circle back to the model for evidence informed clinical decision making. Uh, and you know, we've shown you here as terms of research evidence, the only thing they'll accept are RCTs. <clears throat> they have taken you out of the equation, right? Uh, it really doesn't matter what the clinical state or circumstance of the patient is because if there's no RCTs, you're not going to have a discussion with them anyway. So the whole notion of evidence-informed clinical decision-making and the practitioner's role in that and the role of research in that uh, has completely been dissected out. So the only thing that's left is for the patient to fend for themselves and try to figure out what to do. Uh, or rely on the medical doctor uh, to tell them what to do, uh, which we know how that's going to end up. So again, reminding you that this is the model of, uh, in terms of hierarchy of research, that's well entrenched, well accepted, uh, wherever you look. This was a statement put out by the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation. Uh, as all this stuff started to unfold. There is sufficient evidence to support the management of vertebral subluxation in a vitalistic salutogenic model. Uh, I know myself and any one of the other members of the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation and its board of directors uh, would certainly go to bat and support this statement uh, in any venue. I feel like this statement is fully supported by the scientific literature and it's fully supported uh, in an evidence-informed uh, clinical decision-making model. Uh, you recall that at the pinnacle of the research hierarchy are practice guidelines. While there are a number of practice guidelines that support the management of vertebral subluxation in this model, there are the CCP guidelines that have been updated and revised several times. Uh, there are the ICA's best practices and practice guidelines. There are actually uh, two uh, iterations of this. Uh, the first was more of a consensus document uh, that was then redone a number of years later in an evidence-based model. Fully supports the management of vertebral subluxation. 
Uh, and then there are the PCCRP guidelines. These are the Practicing Chiropractors Committee on Radiology Protocols. Uh, this is uh, a monster of a document that uh, fully supports the uh, use of uh, radiographs to characterize the biomechanical components of vertebral subluxation. Uh, it's important to note that all three of these documents were accepted by the National Guideline Clearinghouse, the NGC. The National Guideline Clearinghouse was part of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, and in order to get included in the National Guideline Clearinghouse, uh, practice guidelines need to undergo, uh, you know, their own own peer review and 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 so forth before they're submitted to the National Guideline Clearinghouse, who then does their own review of it, and then if they accept it, uh, they include it in their database. Now, the problem with the National Guideline Clearinghouse is it has been defunded. Uh, by the Trump administration, uh, so the National Guideline Clearinghouse no longer exists. Uh, however, these guidelines and documents still exist, and they've all been adopted by a number of organizations over the years, uh, and they are taught within CC-accredited uh, institutions, chiropractic institutions. Uh, one of the problems with these guidelines, though, that does exist now is that practice guidelines need to be updated uh, every five years. And at this point, these guidelines uh, need to be updated because they are older than five years. Uh, one of the things that we are doing at the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation is we are developing, a, uh, developing guidelines for the clinical management of vertebral subluxation. What we've done is we've gone back uh, close to eight years uh, and get reviewed and gathered the literature relative to vertebral subluxation. Uh, we have amassed a database of, at this point, four to 5,000 research papers. Uh, these uh, papers are all divided up into 12 distinct chapters. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, and uh, we are in the process of drafting uh, these chapters, which will then go out for peer review to the pre profession. Uh, and then any uh, edits that need to be made to it, uh, and then they'll be published. Uh, we have decided to, instead of just starting over every five years and doing this again, we've decided, the Foundation have decided to establish a permanent best practices initiative. Uh, we're doing this through the, um, through the giving of scholarships. We have a team who is working with uh, Dr. Kent and myself. Uh, out of Sherman uh, College in Spartanburg. That team is led by a project manager. Her name is uh, Dr. Anquinette Stiles. Dr. Stiles is a chiropractor and also has a master's degree in public health. Uh, and she has a fairly extensive uh, research uh, background. And uh, she's leading a team of uh, three other um, scholarship recipients that are on an ongoing basis are searching the literature. They're doing this on a monthly basis and updating each of our 12 chapters as we move forward. So from now on, all we'll need to do every five years is just go back, review the new literature, and uh, update recommendations if that needs to happen. These are the um, the chapters we're talking about or the, the topics we're talking about, history and chiropractic examination, instrumentation, radiographic and other imaging, clinical impressions, reassessment and outcomes assessment, modes of adjustive care, that has to do with technique, uh, duration of care for vertebral subluxation, chiropractic care for children, maternal chiropractic care, vertebral subluxation and well-being, behavioral and mental health issues, and patient safe, uh, safety, privacy, and advocacy. Uh, so that is uh, now an ongoing project. So, you know, to sort of uh, summarize this, the, the subluxation deniers who control the chiropractic cartel have, uh, you know, to their own benefit, systematically dismantled uh, the model for evidence-informed clinical decision-making. Uh, they've taken out the ability of the chiropractor to engage in that process. They've taken out any research other than RCTs and that high level. Um, 
and so they have interfered with the chiropractor's ability to help a patient make clinically uh, evidence-informed clinical decisions about their health care. Um, despite what they say, there is, in fact, uh, several practice guidelines that, and they are at the top of the research hierarchy, that support the management of vertebral subluxation in a vitalistic and salutogenic uh, model. And there is an ongoing uh, best practices initiative uh, happening through the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation uh, out of Sherman College. Uh, that is systematically searching and gathering the most current uh, evidence to support uh, the management of vertebral subluxation in a vitalistic salutogenic model. So that's what's happening. Uh, thanks for your time and attention, and if there's anything, I, any questions I can answer, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.